from him. Then, at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. May my God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of God. And again, <clears throat> thank you for coming out to the service. It's a joy always to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, a tradition that is immediately attached to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and for that we are truly thankful. We, uh, we have before us today the text, Daniel 6. Thank you to Pastor for reading the text for us. We have a continuing account. Last time, we dealt with verses 3 through 15 of Daniel 6. What should Christian leaders do when personal safety is threatened by a beast-like nation or authority? And uh, we discovered that by the Spirit, uh, Christian leaders should serve well, expect trouble, and worship God above all. Today, we're going to turn our attention to chapter 6, 15 through 28, a little bit of overlap. And by God's grace, we're going to learn an important lesson. This is a lesson for all believers who are facing challenging uh, times, even deadly times. Our brothers and sisters in northern Nigeria, other parts of the world who are uh, under duress can, can attest to this. Now, we're not, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of events to switch the opinion of a nation against Christians. And so we need to also be prepared. So the text, the question for the text is this, what truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? Um, we have spoken before how God uses suffering, how God uses trials to improve us by the Holy Spirit's ministry to prepare us for heaven. And this is something that we're going to touch on again today. So what truth about God? You know, it's not a truth about ourselves. It's a truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering. That's our goal. The context leading up to this. Daniel was serving well in the kingdom. Uh, the, Me the Medes and Persians had taken over from the Babylonians. Uh, Daniel rose to the top. He was la creme de la creme. He was the best leader in, uh, in the kingdom. And so Darius the king appointed him number one. Well, jealousy arose from the other leaders and they decided to frame him, uh, that being Daniel, and they couldn't figure out, well, let's try and because we're corrupt, they said. He must be corrupt, too. So we'll just we'll nail him with some corruption charges here. So they looked around for some corruption. Couldn't find it. 
So what do we do? Well, let's nail him with connection to his God. So they developed um, a little ruse for the king to sign. And in chapter 6, verse 7, these guys, these corrupt leaders came and uh, they came to the king and they wanted him to agree to this, to an ordinance, to enforce an injunction. Whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions. So then they went to the king and said, you know, everybody agrees to this. Of course, that was a lie because Daniel wouldn't. But we know that Daniel knew of it. And uh, the king signed it in a flurry of self-interest. And, uh, and then he was stuck because he realized Daniel didn't obey this nonsense. He went and continued his worship of God. And then these people came, these leaders who hated him, and said, look, king, he disobeys the ordinance. He disobeys your executive order. He is, he is a, a nasty guy. So you have to throw him into the den, uh, den of lions. So the king searched around for a way to get out of this, because if you have a good leader, um, you want to keep him. So anyway, it uh, didn't go well. So that's where we pick up in verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men, these corrupt men, came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now, know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Pause right there. So today, we're going to look at the next portions of the texts. We're going to walk through them piece by piece. And we are going to uh, come to an answer to this question, a beginning answer. What truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? What is it? Uh, we'll find it. We'll have several options, but we'll find one, hone in on it, and apply it. So that's what we're going to do. What truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? Let's uh, go to prayer, and then uh, we will introduce the message. Give us the ability, O Lord God, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit to live well even in these days of much confusion. Lord God Almighty, would you help us? Would you help us to stand well, to minister well to our children and grandchildren and beyond? Have us to encourage each other in these days of great evil. Father, I ask that you would help me. I am weak. I'm a sinner, saved by grace. I need all the help I can get. Help me through the Holy Spirit to present this to your glory and so that people would be benefited at the soul level. We ask all of this in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. According to good scholars, we live in a world that is a dangerous place for many reasons. I received a text from Reverend Ali Mati this past week. This is hot off the press last Sunday, in fact. The Right Reverend Adar Ogba, an Anglican bishop in northern Nigeria, along with his wife and driver, were abducted by criminals. They were abducted by extremists and hauled away for ransom and or worse. And this is not an experience for us yet, but it is for many around the globe. And yet it is imperative that the people of God, even in our land, even now, prepare themselves for trials and sufferings. Much of the evangelical word, world doesn't want to hear the word, words trials and sufferings. We want to hear your best life now. We want to hear, oh my, uh, help my 401k and, uh, or whatever. And, but in, and you can ask John and Cindy, in northern Nigeria and in other parts of Pakistan, uh, Ethiopia and places like that, and we know what a 401k is. No idea. The Christians have very little. Many of them are struggling every single day, but they love Jesus first and most. Am I not right? Right. 
to me, someone who is materialistic like myself, that puts me in my place. I need to be in my place, oh God. So today, by way of our text, we'll continue to encourage ourselves forward in times of trials and sufferings. They're going to come. That's how God deals with his people. I don't, I don't have a particular attachment to modern Western evangelicalism anymore. I prefer just to be called a follower of Christ. So today, by way of our text, we will ask this question, what truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? What truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? So we're going to highlight three options. Three options. We're going to settle on one and apply it. And this is Father's Day. There will be an application for fathers, and I think justly so, and properly so. Coming out of this, it'll be one of the final challenges that we have. Father's Day is a day that the church endorses for many reasons, and one of them is that it is not political. It is a day wherein fathers are encouraged to remember that they must be present, not just there, but present. Christian fathers bringing the word of God to children and to grandchildren, bringing it well. Although politicizing the day is, is going on around us, we simply say, God is good. Fathers, take listen to his word. So, what truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? The people of God must grasp. Here's the first option, that God is powerful. Look at verses 14 through 21. We'll pick up at 16, actually. 16 through 21. Okay, God is powerful. God is always powerful and always competent. We've talked about that before. <laughs> He's always powerful and always competent. So if you look at verses four, uh, 16 through 21, look at this. Then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king had no choice. He was caught uh, on his own executive order. The king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. What a testimony of, of Daniel. You know, Daniel's a sinner. We know that from Daniel 9. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is living to God's glory. By the Spirit, I said, faith is a gift in the Old and the New Testament. So it's not something that uh, <clears throat> he can be proud about in the flesh. So Daniel is serving well his God, and the king sees it. So he says, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of his lords, the ring, and not, that not, nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Impressions in wax, for instance. And um, you're not to change this. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. So the king had a rough night. At the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. And you can just hear it. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And I love this answer. Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. Always polite. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. <laughs> o king, live forever. Stop there. Look at the contrast. The king had a rough night. He didn't have any jesters, uh, jesters come in. He didn't have any jugglers. Look at this king. <clears throat> Nothing like that. He didn't want it. He was in anguish. What am I going to do about Daniel. May his God deliver him. What's Daniel doing? Having a good night's sleep, it seems to me. Which lion is softest? Let's see. How about you? Come on over here. Let's have a lie down. Oh, this is great. You would be a good armrest. 
And he's having a good night, it would seem. So he's resting, and then the king goes, Are you okay? Oh, king, live forever. Not a bad night. Hotel Den wasn't so bad. Just in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, back in Daniel chapter 3, you may recall, <coughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, here's another instance. Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, you three guys, worship the image that I sent, sent uh, set up. It's a 90-foot gold image uh, somehow of myself, but it's, it's a toothpick. And so a golden toothpick in the middle of the Jura. Uh, plain. And so uh, they're supposed to worship. And they said, no, we're, we're not going to worship that. No. If God saves us, fine. If he doesn't out of this, that's fine too, because, you know, he's our God and he's, he's living. And uh, so the, and, and Nebuchadnezzar went wild. And then they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. And what happened? One like a son of man was wandering around with them. And then we, we said that might be a Christophany, the pre-incarnate uh, Christ with these people. We don't know. But it's really presented in an interesting way. However, we carry on. Um, nothing happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were brought out of the burning fiery furnace. They weren't burnt. B-U-R-N-T. They weren't burnt. They were um, they didn't smell like smoke. And they seemed to have had a pretty good time in the flames. So they came. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar gave uh, no other god is able to rescue in this way. Remember that? Well, a similar, a similar thing happened here. Uh, he wasn't, uh, Daniel was uh, put in the den. Um, there weren't any flames, but there were hungry lions. And, uh, but God, through his angel, was able to deliver Daniel from the den and the powerful lions. But he was able also to deliver them to deliver him from the unjust treatment at the hands of his enemies. So he delivered them through the power of God. <clears throat> God is more powerful than evil people. He's more powerful than lions and dens and kings who get themselves into trouble. <clears throat> Such is encouraging. Such is encouraging. It's good. But that's not where we want to land. Okay, for the first instance, by the way, the allergies are getting better. <clears throat> so you can probably start wearing deodorant next week. But this week, <clears throat> I'm going to labor through this. <clears throat> it's only in certain atmospheres I'll get the, the allergic reaction. So while this is good, God is powerful, we must keep going. There's another answer. Where is it? Well, let's take a look at verses 25 through 28. <coughs> we see that Daniel is liberated. But then we get to verse 25. Notice this. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations, people's nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you, he said. I make a decree that in my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall, shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Cyrus the Persian and Darius are the same person, according to good scholars. The text can read this in Aramaic. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, even the reign of Cyrus the Persian. <clears throat> so they're likely the same person. So what are we saying here? This, pip, uh, this pagan king said about what he said about God is absolutely true. God is profound. He's deep in character deep in his character. But the king said, he has an eternal nature. Yep, his kingdom is eternal. Sovereign kingship, powerful. God of great mercy, ruler over all. <clears throat> he delivers and he rescues from the power of the lions. Yes, he's powerful. He's also profound. He is awe-inspiring. 
that's crucial. What this pagan said is absolutely true. Inspired by God, working in this pagan's mouth, he produces this text. It's true about God. And God is glorified through it. So far, we have the question, okay, what do we need to know about God? What do we need to know? He's powerful. Yes, he's always powerful and always competent. He's also profound. He's deep in character. God is always this way. Hmm. Delightful quality. However, there's something else. Let's go back to verses 22 through 24. 22 through 24. Look at the text. So Daniel said to the king in 21, O king, left forever. Then 22, notice this. My God sent his angel. Notice his personal. He's very personal with Yahweh. My God sent his angel. All right? And shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. There it is. God is present with Daniel as sovereign Lord over all things. He's powerful, yes, he's profound, but he is present as sovereign Lord over all things. Now let's continue. <clears throat> I've not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I've done no harm. In other words, He was found, notice, found blameless before God. He didn't do the crime that these, he was just worshiping God. And so he was framed, and there's nothing wrong with that, at least up to the point uh, when these folks wanted to frame uh, Daniel. There's nothing wrong with it. There still wasn't anything wrong with it. Daniel continued to worship God in spite of the executive order. And... Um, but it was God who found him blameless. It wasn't Daniel's a sinner. He didn't earn anything. He was just found blameless by God at the same time. He hadn't broken any law against the king. So he's, he was found blameless. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God very personal relationship of trust and faith. And then the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. Note this. They, their children, and their wives, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. The text is very clear what happened. Now, in Deuteronomy 24, 16, if this was a legitimate a Jewish king, he would say, no, only persons who are going to be dealt with are those who committed the sin. But this is a pagan king, and he decided that, okay, they're all going to go, maybe because uh, that um, I don't want any enemies around in court. So he had every one of the family members done away with. Now, it's all done under the sovereignty of God, of course, and it's just. So what do we say about this? God is present as sovereign Lord over all things. He's present by way of an angel to save Daniel, closing the mouths of the lions in a horrible den. Now, it doesn't mean that God has to deliver us when we're in trouble. He doesn't have to. The uh, bishop who was kidnapped with his wife and driver last week, God is not obligated. He's not obliged to set them free. He can if he wishes. In his sovereignty, he certainly can. And we will pray to that end. God help us. God help them. Remember the story in Acts chapter 7 where Stephen uh, was brought before a wicked council. And what did he say? He gave the the history of truth before them, and then he challenged them. He called them out as sinners, and he did that in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they ordered that he be stoned. And, and uh, the apostle Paul, who was at this point unsaved, his name Saul, Saul of Tarsus, was there 
even participating in the death of Stephen. Remember that account? God does not, he's not committed to our comfort. He's committed to bringing us home, but he's not committed to our comfort. He can deliver in this way. It points us to a truth this text does in Daniel. It speaks of God as being present to judge. Present to judge, he will find unbelievers guilty. And being present to deliver or to bless, he finds his own not guilty. That's what this text is driving at. God is present with his people to judge and to bless. That's what it's driving at. God is not committed to our comfort, but he can deliver us in this life from hardship and suffering where he may allow us to go through it to the end and enter into final joy. So the answer to the question, what, are we, what do we need to know about God if we're to stand well in times like these? What do we need to know about God? We're going to be facing trials and sufferings. What do we need to know? Well, we need to grasp this truth. God is present. He is sovereign Lord over all things. He is present with his people. He is present to bless and to judge. Daniel was blessed, found not guilty. Those who conspired against him were found guilty. And through the order of the pagan king, they were dealt with. And to the extreme. Now we say, do we find this in the New Testament? Yes, we do. God is present with his people to bless and to judge. We turn our attention to the final judgment. Because of the cross of Christ and the empty tomb, God will declare his people, those who were joined to him by faith, to be not guilty at the final judgment, Christians. When you stand before the Lord, you will be found not guilty because of the work of Jesus Christ, his death, his life, perfect life, his death on the cross, paying for the penalty of my sin, his resurrection, vindicating the work and the promises of God. God is honored through the resurrection, then the ascension, the promised return, Christ, it is he to whom we point and say, I'm not guilty because of him. By my faith in Jesus Christ, I will be declared not guilty. Take note of Matthew 25. Just hold your finger there in Daniel 6, Matthew 25. This is a picture of the final judgment. I'm not going to read it all. We'll just explain it as we go in portion. Matthew 25, 31 through 34. He's talking about the final judgment. You know, in this passage, you see uh, various parables, the coming of the Son of Man in, in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation, and so on. So there's, a, there's an emphasis on last things. And after this, the plot to kill Jesus is unfolded. So in Matthew 25, note this. The text reads, 31, when the Son of Man comes, that's the favorite title that Jesus used uh, for himself, comes in his glory and all the angels with him. Uh, by the way, we will refer to this passage again when we do Daniel chapter 7, coming up soon. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What kind of truth is this? It's absolute. So here... This text declares that God's sheep will receive eternal life. 
They will dwell with him forever. Take a look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3, later on today, and you will see that in the final version of the kingdom, God will dwell with us and we will dwell with him. This is a covenant, this is covenant language, and it's final fulfillment of all. So, what are we saying? What is the answer to our question? What do we need to know? That God as sovereign Lord is present with his people, P-R-E-S-E-N-T. How is he present? He is present to judge and to bless. That's who he is. And what does this do for us? Well, if we hold to this truth, no evil government or authority can keep his people from his presence. God will be with us to bless and to judge, even ultimately, injustice. That is the God whom we serve. He is present to bless and he's present to judge. Because this is true, I can, give, I can rest. I can rest. I can trust. I can lie down. <clears throat> I can get up. Why? Because God is present with his people. He is covenant, he is a covenanting God, and he is in, in very close relationship with us through Jesus Christ, the full flower of the gospel, beginning in the Old Testament, Genesis 3:15, working its way through Abraham and the covenants, all the way up to the final version in Christ Jesus. We can rest in him. We can rest in Christ. No evil government or authority can keep his people from his presence to bless. In this life, and especially in the next. Uh, can God deliver us from very hard things? Yes, he can. And he chose to do that with the Apostle Paul and his companions in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. We read of this wonderful rescue, if you like. But ultimately, Paul was beheaded. Uh, by tradition, we know that he was beheaded and, and he died. God didn't choose to deliver him from that, but he kept him alive long enough to honor his name. Honor his name and to benefit Paul and all who read. So, that's the answer to our question. What is the question? What truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? It's this. Even if they're coming, there could be upon us as a church, or they're coming. What, do we, what shall we then say? God is present, is sovereign over all things. He is with us. Remember Matthew 25. In verse 46 of Matthew 25, and these will go away into eternal punishment. We'll touch on that in a moment, but the righteous unto eternal life. We have eternal life coming for us. Hallelujah. God is present with his people. If there's one thing that is missing in broader evangelicalism, not here, but I'm talking about broader evangelicalism, God really isn't present with many people. He's just a concept. Yeah, he's a concept. He's not really present. If he was present, we would live differently. <clears throat> Shall we take our Lord into a place of sin? I think not. So he's not really present to most in the stated evangelical church. I think, for the most part, um, many just see him at arm's length. And something to consider if I need a new car, I'll just ask him for one. But God is present, and he's present to bless and to judge. He's a God of mercy and a God of justice. And that's that. A couple of challenges. The first thing is this. To all fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, teach your children concerning the gospel. Tell them about the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, the promised coming of Jesus Christ. Present the gospel, beginning in the Old Testament, working all the way through the New. 
Talk about, in, in concert with this, the presence of God to bless and to judge. Talk about it. Resist the false teachings that come from many churches, and, and they tell, oh, you need entertainment, you need gospel light, you need to just feel better. You know, you just need to feel better about yourself. Um, that's not true. We need to worship God and love him first and most and realize that there is hope in Christ Jesus and there is more to life than grubbing around in this place. Remember, teach. Many fathers are in the room, so to speak, but they're not present with their children. Children feel detached. Many adult children feel detached from parents later on in life, and they say things in counseling like, uh, Dad was there, but he wasn't there. Dad was there. He's always preoccupied with something, and we felt like we were, uh, don't know, just things. Now we, we press in that. We say, well, you're not a victim. But we are sinners, and we're sinned against. So let's talk about that. And let's seek rest in Christ, peace in him. Many fathers are in the room, but they're not present. So may the Holy Spirit give all fathers, grandfathers, the ability to carry on, to teach well, to come home. And even though it's been a long day, you sit down with the children and you listen to their stories. And even though you just want to fall on the floor, well, maybe just fall on the floor but listen to the stories and say, okay, but I want you to know something else. Uh, part of me doesn't want to do this, but the other part of me says, yes, give me five minutes and I'll come back and I'll sit here and I will hold you because you're a gift from God and I will teach you about Jesus. And I will tell you who he is. Even if I have a commitment, that commitment can wait at least a few minutes. You are special. You are precious. So may the Holy Spirit give us the ability to live as such. And let us say that after, after having thought, and you say to yourself, one dad may say, I'm a father and I wasn't present. I didn't speak of the presence of God. I didn't speak of the presence of Christ in a real way. What shall I then do? Well, come and we'll talk and we'll pray together, and we'll talk about things that are needed, confession, repentance, and talk about newness in Christ Jesus. There is always hope, so we always bring hope in Christ, and you can lift your head again and reconnect with your children as best as you can. So that is important. If the heavenly father, if it is imperative for the church to grasp that our father in heaven is present with his people, it is in a, in a, in a way uh, under that truth, it is very important that fathers be present with their families and teach the gospel and the presence of God to bless and to judge, even in trials. And lastly, hear this. At the last judgment, those who are in Adam, those who have no Jesus, will be declared guilty and cast into the lake of fire. They'll be separated from God. I remember a lecture that R.C. Sproul gave many years ago, and someone said to him, Dr. Sproul, do you believe in uh, actual fire and hell? And he said, well, you know, let me tell you this. The term fire in the Bible is a term that is trying to describe the horror of something that is so bad that the word fire approaches it. But in languages like Greek and Hebrew, when you see this picture language, you understand that the reality that it's describing is far worse. It's far worse. So the lake of fire is far worse than anything we can imagine, any molten, boiling substance, far worse. 
It's the judgment of God and it's just and true. So in Matthew 25, if you go there still, look at verse 41. Then he will say, Jesus, to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then go to verse 46. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Sheep and goats. Sheep are declared righteous. They're blessed and will enter into eternal life. Goats justly declared guilty and in, enter into eternal damnation. God is present to bless and to judge. Therefore, I say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you are in, in hearing of this and you are not a Christian, if you have no Jesus, if he's not first in your life, then repent. Turn away from a life of sin and trust in Jesus Christ who suffered, died, and rose again. So therefore, there it is. What truth about God is essential for believers to grasp in times of trial and suffering? God is present with his people. He's present to bless and to judge. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. And Christian, think of this. No matter what you're facing right now, you love Jesus first and most. It doesn't uh, it really in the final analysis. Whatever is going on in your life right now, hard difficult, deadly, know this. If you love Jesus, if you love him first and most, oh, we're not perfect until we see Jesus but face to face, but, but if you love him and by the Holy Spirit you're seeking to serve after him, know this. The day is coming at the final judgment where you will be declared because of Christ not guilty and you will enter into eternal peace. I'm looking forward to it. How about you? Let's, I guess that's enough. Let's sing, Mike. And then, Reverend Phil, would you close us out, sir? Go ahead and take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 469, Trust and Obey. As we close our time together, let us stand and sing these verses of 1, 3, and 5 as our hearts cry in light of what we have heard from God's word. May we make this our anthem as we go from here. Thank you.